Yeah, because I mean, books have already power, right? I mean, we don't have to prove its power. It's already there. So we just have to show it to the people by like, elast- how do you say, putting a spotlight on the fun side of it rather than the gloomy side of it. Stick your neck out. The weekly podcast of the Giraffe Heroes Foundation. Welcome to Stick Your Neck Out, the podcast to restore your faith in humanity. My guest today is Yoshimi Horiyoshi, Kantari alumni and founder of Bookworm Foundation, a unique non-profit that brings books, fun and hope to rural communities in northern Thailand. Yes, we are talking about a mobile library for children and adults both with and without disabilities in rural Thailand, founded by a Japanese woman who happens to be blind. Yoshimi, welcome to our podcast. Hi, Jean-Pierre. Thank you for having me. Uh, Thank you for accepting the invitation. Yoshimi, you traveled as a young student through Thailand and you discovered something that made you wonder. What was so astonishing in Thailand, a part of the wonderful landscape and its wonderful people? Well, I really fell in love with Thailand from the beginning, but as I got to know the country... I realized that they don't really understand one thing that I really love since childhood, which is books. I really loved reading since as far as I can remember. And Thai people, many of them have kind of like allergy against reading. They are like, (laughs) they are almost afraid that the books will bite them or something like that. Okay. And how comes? Well, there might be some uh, different reasons, but One thing is that reading is deeply connected to studying, like learning and studying. And I mean, who wants to study when you have free time a lot, right? Not everyone, obviously. So the fun side of the reading has not been really focused in Thai society up to now. Yeah, and that's a, that's a pity, actually, because books are like beautiful. You know, you, if, if you read, you go through, through another world. I mean, that's the point why I I also love to read, you know, because in each book I, can, I find a connection. You were born in Japan and you are a blind who calls herself a bookaholic. So you are definitely into books. Why are they so important to you? When I was a child, I didn't really understand that. But now that I think of it, why I really got to love it, maybe because I was in a really small community, a very rural community, my Father used to run a fa- small farm and we had very rather traditional house with, you know, like extensive family, like with grandma, grandfather, grandmother, like that. No? And my world was only like five kilometer radius, you know, okay. like, yeah. um, the Tokyo was foreign country and America is like space or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> so my world was really, really small in a physical way. And also my parents and my family were quite concerned about me. I was really active child, but I was also almost blind. So they were really afraid that I may get hurt or something. So I did a lot of things, but um, maybe I my world was so small. And I see that like in the books, I could go anywhere. And it was kind of like an adventure in another way. Mm. So maybe that's why I really got to like it a lot. So I imagine your parents read a lot to you as a a child? My parents, not so much. It was mostly my grandfather from my mother's side who was living with us because he had a kidney problem and he was not so strong. So he couldn't work in a farm so much. So he was available for me the most. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So he was, he was abused a lot by me by becoming a, (laughs) How do you say, like a full time reader as long as he's okay. at home? Yeah. Okay. So, oh, but that's beautiful. Yeah. My parents actually don't love reading. <laughs> then my at grandpa, all. my grandpa was also, I mean, my grandmother, she died when I was in a really young age. But my grandfather, he was also the guy who, who introduced me to, to reading, kind of. Oh, cool. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. 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 Wh- which kind of feelings you associate with reading? Fun, escaping. <laughs> Everything, 
relaxing, inspiring. Uh, yeah, everything positive because I don't read what I don't like. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm not really, I'm definitely not academic type of reader. I mean, there are different, different way of, I think like when you read, I mean, your book and you, you have really different relationship, like, like with friends, right? So some people may feel it like uh, inspiring. Some people may feel it like energizing. Some people may feel it like nutritious because you become smarter or something. But for me, yeah, fun was the most important part for me. Yeah, nice. After you finished the Kantari program, you made your dream to venture out with the mobile library come true. You know, every time I hear the combination mobile library, I have a picture of you carrying tons of books on your back. Tell me, is this picture right or I'm getting the concept totally wrong? <laughs> yeah, more or less the same. I mean, in the beginning, in the first activity that I did, I carried uh, the books in the backpack and went to went on the bus with another volunteer just two of us went to and went to the orphanage in the outskirts of bangkok so that was the very beginning and also the first one or two years we often carried uh, the books in a motorbike when i moved to the north and uh, because we didn't have the truck that time so i would carry books in my bag and put the rest in the basket of the motorbike in the front and then we would mm. go, yeah, like that. So, <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And now you have a truck? Yes, now we have a truck thanks to a donation of a local company in my hometown in Japan. Oh, okay, okay, nice. What exactly does Bookworm do? So at the moment, we have three projects. We have library project, uh, literacy project, and new new books project. Library project is we have both mobile and not mobile activities. So. We have a library, and from there we do mobile libraries around the around the district that we work in, which is like uh, one hundred kilometers away from the second biggest city in Thailand, which is called Chiang Mai. And then we do the li uh, library activities, or lots of fun activities related to books, and sometimes not related to books too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and for the literacy project, we have two centers where we teach literacy like Thai and English alphabet and also easy counting skills to children small children from the ethnic minority groups and the last one the new new books we have this is our only one and only production project in which we produce picture books that can be enjoyed by children with and without disabilities so it's got both colorful illustration and something that you can always feel, touch and feel, big letters and also braille. Yeah, yeah. that's beautiful. So those are the projects that we do. That's nice. I want you to listen to something you shared to me to help with the preparation for this podcast. And it will be great if you could tell me what is this about. No. This is the sound of children at one of the literacy centers called Sunshine Kids Center. Uh, the teacher is from the community, in the community itself, and she really loves reading much more than studying herself. <laughs> so they really specialize a lot in music. But of course, the main objective of the center is to teach Thai and English alphabet, but they really love singing. And this is, they are singing in Akha. Which is their language, yeah. There's also, I mean, you also like do storytelling with the kids? Yeah, actually, we are not really doing it. Usually, because the centers are in the mountain area. So uh, we have the people in the local area who works with the children every day. And from our library, we just visit once a month or so just to follow up. And then sometimes we bring the fun activities also. But the teachers... There, like the every day they, they read the stories before they take a nap. So you said a lot about having fun with reading and, and so on. So it would be nice, I mean, for me to understand how are these kids having fun? Mm. 
while reading. Maybe you can hear the example how the kids are having with、uh, reading time. Okay, let's listen to it. So it sounds like a lot of fun, but since I don't speak Thai and I also don't speak Japanese, un- unfortunately, <laughs> will be really nice if you let me know what what was happening there.、Mm-hmm. Oh, this is a scene from one of the latest activities at our library called Rang Mai Playtime. So Rang Mai means、uh, in Thai a cocoon from the silkworm, and we we call it playtime because we want to destroy. Or break the understanding or the prejudice of book is for studying. So we do a lot of fun activity in one afternoon each month, gathering some children and some volunteers from a local high school. And in this recording,、uh, they were having、uh, reading time、uh, of a, a big picture book called Magic Tunnels. So they were crossing from one tunnel to another and becoming different things like. Moon monster. I think the children really love the monster the most. <laughs> so that's why you can hear a lot of sound. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Reading about your activities with the bookworm, I learned that you have different ideas apart from bringing the joy of reading to children of all backgrounds. Can you talk a bit more about all the things you do once you set out your mobile library track, Haruno? Yeah. Sure. We go to different places. I mean, we have. So many different types of activities. So we have the、um, mobile life,、um, co- something called bookworm caravan.、Um, we go to different places like temples, children's homes, or local community village, like gathering place and things like that. And then we do mobile library where ch- people can just come and borrow books. And we also do some like crafting that children can have fun, like art and craft. Kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, but you are also giving a social kind of、uh, view,、uh, like like you are mixing of able and disabled. You are you are working on inclusion preparation for hill tribe children to be able to attend public education, taking care of the elder, and so on. Is it is it right? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, okay, we have different activities, but the the whole thing is like no matter what I do, I mean. Library is important for me, but books are not the most important thing. Of course, books are there for the people. People are the most important, right? So for us, books are just tools. Reading is the tool to connect people, people and people, and also people to society. So we do lots of mobile library activities that we visit some houses of people who can't come to the library on his own, on his or her own, like. People with disabilities, or elderly people, or a mother who just had baby, and so on and so forth. And we also, the reason why we started our literacy projects is because they couldn't access things like the library and even the reading skills up to now. That's why we wanted to make a bridge between them and the reading because it wouldn't make sense for us to just bring books to them. When they can't read comfortably, yeah, 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 no, no, that's that's right. How did a blind Japanese girl end up starting this project in Thailand? Just because I felt like it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I didn't really feel. Hmm. I guess the most important reason. Hmm. Well, there there are different reasons. For example, I mean. I I started this project in Thailand because I love Thailand, not because there was needs, especially in Thailand.、Okay. I think this kind of needs is everywhere in many many countries, especially in developing countries. But I really loved Thailand at that time、uh, already, so I picked Thailand and I wanted to do the reading because I was thinking, so what can a blind person do to make the life of people who might be missing out from the mainstream society?、Mm. 
in one way or another. And I was thinking, okay, maybe books can be one because, okay, I can't read for them. I can't read. I can't just pick up a book from my our library shelf and read to the children. No, I can't do that. But I can run a, a lot of activities that they can do such things from our activities. No? So I, I did it because for me, that's what I really love. And for, for me to enjoy that, I get the help from so many different people from when I was young. When I was young, my family read it for me. When I grew up, I could read Braille books or the audio books, but usually in Japan, they are made by volunteers, like thousands of volunteers who are scattered around the country, tens of thousands of them. And they take time to pr- transcribe the books into Braille and audio so that I can read. So I thought, okay, now that I want to do something, something good for Thai culture, and what if I can do this, it makes sense because I love it and they don't seem to enjoy it. Uh, they don't seem to have the access to it. And yeah, that really made sense for me. That's why. Yeah, that's uh, nice. <laughs> let's let's say uh, there are a lot of families out there struggling with their kids because they don't want to read. What would you say is a good strategy to start promoting reading? I think when you start to read to the child, it's really important that the children are the one who pick the book. So it may not be really interesting for the adult, for the parents, but if the kid likes the reading, then you should do it. And I think, I mean, you should start really early. What I really want to avoid is that the first book that a child pick up is the textbook when they enter the school. This is the worst case scenario. Then, then they automatically become a tool for study in their ma- mindset. Yeah, that's right. You know, people are nowadays consuming information faster than ever before. There have been astounding technological advancements uh, over the last two decades, such as the mainstream integration of smartphones and social media. But as a result, books and other forms of print media are sometimes regarded as a thing of the past or things that are exclusively associated with dreaded homework assignments. How can you fight this? I don't intend to fight it because, I mean, things change, right? I mean, I think the society change and also the needs change accordingly. So if the society change so that they always shift to, I mean, all shift to the digital age, this is, we can't fight against that. But what I really think at the moment What I think uh, is a difference between the physical book and the book in the uh, digital form is the the way that the book can work with all your five senses. Because you can smell the book, Mm -hmm. you can feel the paper, both the soft paper inside and the hard cover outside in your hands. And when you turn the page together with your parents, it's very different from when you press a button or a swipe on the screen and you can smell this i mean the smell is very important also even though i can't read the books yes. in the print way but i really love bookshops yeah because i love the smell and you yes. don't get it from kindle sorry yeah yeah <laughs> no 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 you don't <laughs> there's also a truth that uh, says we are what we read do you think besides changing how we fundamentally think that the books also changes the way we relate to others? Yeah, I think so. I mean, not every book changes your life or the way you think. But, for example, if you're living in a society where you have rather conservative community, you don't get so much influence from different way of thinking. No? You may be exposed to a certain type of way of thinking, even media like TV or something, you may be... Um, Your family may be focused on one channel or something like that. But if you are reading books, even if you are living in a very small, rather conservative or rather liberal community, you may be exposed to all sorts of different ways of thinking. And in that way, I think books can be really impactful for the life, especially if you are in a, how do you say, rather closed environment. 
What can people do to gain from reading old books, books we often label great books, and then set on a high shelf to gather dust? Um, you see, I think many, many book lovers say the same thing, but books are choosing, waiting for the time, right time for our in our life. So you may not be interested in reading the old classics, like world classic literature at all for decades, but in one point, maybe you will pick up the book. I mean, the books will definitely yeah, talk yeah. to you and and then you pick it up. And until that time comes, no matter how other people recommend it to you, you don't really like it. I mean, at least I don't. So I can't read what I don't feel it's time for it. Mm. Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. I mean, I I also have, I I have to, to say if if the book in the first 10 pages, if I don't really want to stay with the book after 10 pages mm. i just i just quit i mean some people say yeah. that's um that's a no-go i know people who says no no i just try to read it until the end even though it's a bad book but i can't i don't know how it's yeah, for you because the books yeah it's not the time for the book yeah, yeah. it's not the cue yeah yeah <laughs> Have there been certain books that uh, have been touchstones for you in the last years? Well, <laughs> there's one book that kind of shaped my life and get my organization started, got my organization started in the first place, which is a book called uh, My Path Leads to Tibet, which is the, the first book written by Ms. Sabria Tembek and the founder of Kantari. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not here to advertise for it, but I read it when I was like in school, like for 14 or 15 years old. And I was thinking, wow, wow, there, the world is big. There are so many interesting people out there. And I didn't think of anything afterwards. I mean, it was just like one of the adventure stories that you read and nothing close to you. I mean, that just that she was a blind person. She was so far away from my reality that I didn't really feel anything more. Yeah? was so far for me but then i i went to a conference in malaysia as an observer at, uh, when i was in in university and a professor a polish professor it recommended me to go to a workshop which happened to be a workshop held by sabria herself and paul also so there i met the writer on the stage and i was like wow i i know this person <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and then a few years later, well, at that time they were making the plan for Kantari, and after that, a few years later, she became a. Uh, I went to a kind of a workshop in Bangkok for the young blind leaders in Asia, and Sabre was resource person there, and then I got to talk to her. I got to meet her first in the book, second on the stage, and third time I met her as a person to person and then she invited me to apply for Kantari the first batch so the book in a way led my way to open book one foundation okay yeah beautiful where is uh, book one foundation staying now how how are you guys doing activities are going well thailand is quite successful in managing the covid-19 so it is affected of course but it's not so bad that they they are not in a full lockdown or anything so we can do some activities also the children's centers are running both of them only the no no books project uh, the book production project is uh, stopped because i have to be there to proof feeling you know not proof reading but proof feeling the parts that needs to be used for the books but we are facing some challenges for the funding because I have been heavily depending on the spontaneous fundraising and something like presentations and motivational speeches, inspirational speeches, this kind of thing. And I haven't been able to do that for nearly one year now. So that's, that's the hardest challenge that we are facing. So we are trying to reshape our funding structure by recruiting 1,000 um, supporting members who support us by annual membership of 25 euros or so. Then I hope I uh, wish you all the best, of course. Yeah, <laughs> and I hope that you can you keep doing the, this this wonderful work. 
Do you mean is there is there some kind of I mean, you know, sometimes you experience something and that that stays on your on your mind that all the time. Is there some kind of story you can relate to Bookworm Foundation? This kind of stories that is always there that reminds you that what you are doing is is awesome, is beautiful. Well, I mean, many people think that our organization is for the children, but the most in, most touching moment, one of the most touching moment that I had was with an elderly lady who comes to the library quite often. Well, the lady is in her 60s and she came and told us one day that it was really a life-changing moment for her because she had depression uh, some years ago um, because she had some family problems and she was really depressed and she, she was on medication quite heavily. And then somebody recommended her to come to the library because we had quite a lot of books. And she started to read uh, books from the memoir and biography section that we have. And then after she read some stories, especially the stories of people who went through some challenges, she realized that what she is going through is not only her, you know, like she's not the only one who is suffering so much. And she felt so comforted by that. And her depression got really better. And the medication that she was taking was much, much less. And she's feeling much better now, she said. And I was really touched. And for, for a person like that, even one person like this, it's worth doing what we did for 10 years. That's the point. You, you just nailed it. You, you managed to really find uh, the sense of what you are doing. And that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, because, I mean, books have already power, right? I mean, we don't have to prove its power. It's already there. So we just have to show it to the people by, like, elast how do you say, putting a spotlight on the fun side of it rather than the gloomy side of it. Yeah, yeah. Yoshimi, it was really nice hearing about your project, which me and our listeners are for sure able to picture very well now. Tell us, what are you going to do next and how can we be part of it? Well, the first thing... Please join our dream, how do you say, dream project by joining the Bookworm Club, which supports what we are doing. So our goal, dream goal is 1,000 people. So if we get 1,000 people who give us uh, 25 euros in a year or 1,000 baht per year, then if we can get 1,000 of you who can support us, 70% of our running costs can be covered. So that would be really the first step for us to become more sustainable. And if you are one of the social entrepreneurs or have any great ideas, especially the business ideas for us to implement or to work together with us, please pitch it to us because we are not business people at all. And we need business to <laughs> because we can't depend on donation forever. We need to have income generation. Yep. Thank you so much for being here today thank you also for having us and there we are at the end of the podcast to restore your faith in humanity my guest today Yoshimi Horiyoshi you'll find the stories of the Kantari alumni and the giraffe heroes the stories of people sticking their necks out every Tuesday on Spotify iTunes our homepage and every other place where you get your podcast and if you subscribe you don't have to look out for us we'll be coming to you Another thing, if there is a friend, a family member or someone you know who is doing a great work in the community, someone sticking her, his, its neck out, just nominate this person or this institution as a giraffe hero or tell us about them. Come and visit us at giraffeheroes.eu. Next week is going to be all about taboos in our podcast. A taboo, as you already know, is an implicit prohibition on something based on a cultural sense that it is excessively repulsive or perhaps too scared for ordinary people. Next week, we have two guests, Apar Nakupan from India and Ruang Tak Geo Gemchan from Thailand. My name is Jean-Pierre Aguirre and I hope you join us also in our social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and YouTube. But more importantly, I hope you join us again next week. Stick your neck out. The weekly podcast of the Giraffe Heroes Foundation. 